I'd like to move on to how we approach treatment decisions in a newly diagnosed patient with CML. We've gone from a disease that we had suboptimal therapy for using interferon um, RSC and um, with, with patients essentially presenting frequently in chronic phase and accelerating through to blast crisis and dying of their leukemia. We've gone from that scenario to a situation where we had a wonderful targeted therapy, imatinib, and that has spawned the development of newer, um, newer um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And so we now have a series of drugs for both the newly diagnosed patient and a patient who is either whose disease is either failing or the patient is not tolerating imatinib um, to choose from. So we have a large number of drugs to choose from. And we've gone from, we had the sweet spot when we just had imatinib when, when counseling a newly diagnosed patient was not as complicated as the situation that we have now. Um, so we have more kind of complexity in the decision-making process. So the question that I have for you is, in a newly diagnosed patient with um, chronic myeloid leukemia, do you start imatinib first? Do you start with a second-generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor? Um, what are the roles of, of the various agents that we have? And Stu, maybe I'll ask you to go ahead and... So uh, this is becoming more and more complicated, not just because, because we have a lot of drugs that work, and also now we have some cost issues that'll be developing over next year with generic is coming. Um, but one, I, one of the things I try to do when I first see a patient is figure out, first off, what's the chances that they're going to respond? So I try to do my SOCOL score or my HASFRD score, look at the size of the spleen, look at the height of the platelet count to see if this is a higher risk patient where I certainly want to be thinking about a, a more potent drug like a second generation. If I don't have that type of situation and I have all the drugs on, the, you know, on my table, I then try to look to see what are the patient factors, which things the patient you know, will fit with the drug. The young person who's very erratic, you know, who comes in, who has work shifts and things like that, might not be able to do a twice a day drug. The diabetic might not be able to fast. The person with bad you know, lung issues may not be able to take a drug that might have a pulmonary side effect. So I try to match the drug with the side effects with the comorbidities to try to find the best fit. Um, but then no matter which drug I pick, we get back to the monitoring because you know, make sure that the patient's tolerating the drug, make sure the patient's able to, to respond to the drug. So you can't go wrong with picking the drug. There may just be better fits for the patient. Yeah, and there are three, there are three of the five drugs that are available of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors are um, approved to treat frontline therapy. And um, again, from the de development of imatinib um, and nilotinib and dasatinib are the other two second generation drugs that are available up front. And so I think that that is a really important active dialogue that we have with our newly diagnosed patients. Yeah, my approach has been very similar to what Stu mentioned. And obviously you don't want to, you know, uh, choose a therapy that's going to be difficult for a patient to either adhere to or may have, uh, may not, or that may have a relatively unique side effect that uh, the patient may not be able to tolerate. Um, my preference in recent years has been to start second generation kinase inhibitors. Um, I would say especially in younger people um, um, based upon the superior uh, response rates, cytogenetic and molecular response rates, and we know now also, you know, higher rates of complete molecular remission with these with these agents. Um, uh, but you know, I think to be you know uh, to be totally you know fair, um, if we if imatinib is a lot less expensive when we don't know how much it's going to cost, you know, initially. I mean, it may not be substantially less expensive for, for a while. But if it is substantially less expensive, then I think we have to sort of ask ourselves, you know, do we, if you look at the percentage of patients with five years of follow-up on the ENSD study, which compared nilotinib versus imatinib, or the decision study, which compared dasatinib versus imatinib, versus imatinib and, we, and we ask, well, what clinical benefit was there? And if we, and if we, at the moment, you know, disregard complete molecular response as a potential clinical benefit in being able to discontinue therapy, and we just focus on accelerated and blast phase transformations, while, while the differences, you know, may or may not 
border on statistical significance, the, the percentages, the absolute percentage of patients who, who perhaps benefit from starting a second generation TKI from that perspective is probably only in the order of about two to three percent. And um, on top of that, if, if, if we consider what we know now about the three month milestone, you know, one can ask, you know, what would the potential outcome be if we started imatinib and then after three, in everybody, if it's generic, and then after three months, if they're not meeting the milestone, then switch them. So I, I think there will probably always be some difference in favor of the second generation, but I think it gets, it, it, it shrinks further and further. And, um, and if cost, and this is a big if, if cost comes into the equation in a big way, I think it, you know, it would be very reasonable um, you know, in the future, uh, if, that, if that's the case, to consider starting imatinib uh, in, in everybody. But um, you know, I think a lot really remains to be seen about where things are going. With Can cost. I ask how you balance that with this, uh, the notion that the higher generation drugs may in fact have um, more long-term complications or more long-term uh, side effects that, that you have to weigh into this. Because uh, I think we all very much share a similar strategy in approaching a new patient, but in the back of our minds, we're learning more and more that with longer-term follow-up, there are medical issues that arise um, probably more frequently with the second-generation drugs. No, we do see, in fact, as the, the what we call the common side effects with imatinib, we see them less often with second generation TKIs. Essentially, uh, the bone aches, the periorbital edema, the swelling, these are chronic side effects that bother a lot of patients. We see them less often with the second generation TKI. However, the serious side effects, we see them more often with the second generation TKI. For example, the pleural effusion on the zatinib, although most of them are grade one and two, still they do occur. Uh, Rarely we do see the pulmonary artery hypertension, but one should be very careful. And but with nilotinib, we see the vascular signals. Essentially, with the NSND, the four or five years update, we see the incidence, uh, the prevalence increasing. Uh, within four or five years, we had 7.5% of incidence of thrombotic events. This is scary, so one really should be careful about that. Now, when I go back to Neil, you mentioned starting with imatinib therapy and assess at three months. Eventually, we can take the opposite approach. If you but really based on the data, and that will bring me to the milestones uh, Jessica is going to discuss. The three months milestone is very important, or six months. One could consider induction therapy with second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors, have an optimal response early on, and eventually move to maintenance with imatinib. Obviously, nobody had a clear answer which one is the best way to go. Maybe a randomized trial will happen, that's it. Wonderful. Um, what about a drug like pegylated interferon? Is there still a role for that? You know, the trials so far, uh, the famous trial was published in New England by the French, the SPIRIT trial, where randomized patient to imatinib, high dose imatinib combination with RSC or PEG interferon. They showed that we can improve responses, although in the long run there was no impact, and that was essentially due to decreasing the dose or dropping the dose because of side effects. So they modified the trial and they reduced the dose of the PEG interferon. Clinically, I can tell you from my experience, it's hard to convince a patient to get an injection not approved by insurance, off-label prescription, when you get the TKI and you do so well. So it's hard to get this combination. Now, there are specific cases where maybe it's important. Two cases I gave you, for example, the pregnant woman, a young patient who had the desire to become pregnant, and you really wanted to have a deep molecular response and be able to stop the drug or maintain them on PEG interferon. Anecdotally, you can consider this approach. Or now we're moving into stopping therapy approach where you want to stop TKI. Eventually, somebody with a minimal disease, you can add PEG interferon. We have the trial in Houston. Again, it's hard to get patient, but the concept is try to have this combination, target stem cells, and be able to stop therapy and hope for the cure. Right. Okay. Um, when we talked briefly about this, about the various toxicities or side effects of each of these agents, but when you're using a next generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor for a de novo or newly diagnosed patient with chronic myeloid leukemia, how do you choose desatinib over nilotinib? Um, Doug, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I think when you're thinking about um, uh, next generation drugs, I think it tends to sort of line up 
I tend to sort of line them up based on medical issues and, and sort of uh, um, what, what are the risks associated with those individual drugs. And, and I, I less so am I worried whether they're going to respond or not outside of the setting of mutational testing, which can guide me. Um, but but I, I've tended to think about, so for, for desatinib, we worry about pulmonary issues and fluid accumulations like effusions. And, and folks, patients that may not be able to tolerate that very well, uh, certainly would be someone who I may not be as interested in, in using that drug. There can be a fair number of small side effects, headaches, GI upset early on, f some fatigue. Uh, but I think most of those go away with, with some time.